is uh, Victor Chen. I'm the founding director of the Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education. I hope you enjoy this uh, wonderful musical uh, interlude uh, with Mario. So on behalf of the uh, trustees of the Dalai Lama Center, welcome. We're going to have an amazing uh, afternoon uh, with the Nobel laureates and with uh, Mary Robinson, the uh, former Irish uh, president, uh, who will uh, have an intimate conversation uh, uh, this afternoon. What I would like to uh, say uh, for now is that um, it is it's hard for me to find words to, uh, to be grateful for His Holiness coming back to Vancouver uh, now three times within uh, five years. And also the fact that uh, in 2006, um, he was given uh, honorary citizenship by the uh, Canadian government. And... Uh, So it's, um, it's during that time in uh, 2006 that uh, we started to uh, work uh, to create this Dalai Lama Center for Peace and Education in uh, uh, Vancouver. And uh, our idea is not to create a uh, palace uh, for the Dalai Lama, for His Holiness, but rather to uh, create a, uh, a kind of a home for a secular vision of uh, His Holiness. And that secular vision, uh, and this is his uh, first commitment uh, in life, and that is to promote and foster universe, universal values like compassion, forgiveness, and altruism. So I think that the work of the Dalai Lama Center is really to translate these ideals into uh, initiative and specific uh, con uh, 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 programs that can make a difference uh, to uh, uh, people's life, to uh, uh, improve the quality of life of people um, in terms of uh, the physical as well as uh, the spirit uh, and mind. So it's, um, uh, it's really important, I think, that uh, we, we take his words to promote these universal uh, values and uh, to find a way so that we are actually able to uh, create action, because I think this is what His Holiness wants something that uh, at the end of the day, there are results that uh, improve the lives of others. Uh, so I want to, uh, I'm reminded of uh, my neighbor, uh, Michael, who told me a little story about uh, the hummingbird. There was a very big and horrible forest fire raging in the, in the forest. And all the animals and uh, insects, they were just cow cowering outside uh, the forest. Uh, they feel that uh, they were so uh, uh, horrified by the magnitude uh, of the problem, this big uh, forest fire, and they are not able to do anything about it. This hummingbird flew to the river and carried out a drop, a little drop of water in its beak, went to the fire and dropped the, the water uh, onto the fire. And the little bird did this over and over again. And uh, he was made fun of by all the animals and insects uh, in the forest. They said, why are you doing this? There's no way that you, uh, you can do anything to put out this fire. And the hummingbird just said, I'm just doing whatever I can to help. So I think that uh, the, uh, the session that we are going to see is that uh, we hope that all of you 
uh, will be inspired by the wisdom of His Holiness, uh, by the, uh, the Nobel laureate uh, and uh, Mary Robinson, uh, and that we will all be inspired to uh, do whatever, whatever we can to help. So uh, for now, uh, I would like to uh, introduce a video that uh, Karen Armstrong, uh, who is the recipient of the uh, 2008 uh, TED Prize, uh, have created uh, for, for all of you. So if we are ready to uh, roll the video, Thank you. Treat all others as we wish to be treated. Treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. This is an image of how the world can be. We posted drafts of the text for the Compassion Charter online. We then gathered together people from the five different major religions. Analyzing, writing, critiquing the language there to synthesize all of this into the powerful document that now has unified us all across the globe. Bring compassion back to the center of religion and from that point activate the rest of the world. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious Illegal, spiritual, ethical, human beings all over the world must be cared for. We have information at our fingertips and that information is pushing us to do something about what's going on around the world. We are at a critical juncture in history. The environmental crisis, the food crisis, the financial and economic crisis. Something is fundamentally wrong. We are living in a period of commercial globalization. What we really need is spiritual globalization. Karen Armstrong is a very dear friend. Uh, I still remember we first met a few years ago uh, in the Sun Valley, Idaho. She's a very uh, prolific uh, writer. Uh, I think she has written uh, over 20 books. Uh, she has written about Buddhism, Christianity, uh, Islam. Uh, she is uh, a big... Uh, a superstar in places like uh, Pakistan because her book uh, about uh, Islam is so uh, compelling and uh, something that is very uh, much admired by uh, Muslim uh, worldwide. She won the, uh, the TED Prize. Uh, how many of you know the uh, website TED.com? It's a fantastic uh, website and I'm, I, I'm glad that uh, the founder of TED, uh, Chris Anderson is actually uh, among us somewhere. Where are you, Chris? There he is, uh, Chris Anderson. Uh, Chris Anderson is the uh, person who is responsible for the growth of TED in the last few years. I think uh, over time, they have something like 150 uh, million viewers uh, on their website, so it's just an incredible, uh, magnificent, magnificent uh, feat. So they created the TED Prize, and in 2008, 
uh, Karen Armstrong was the winner of this prize. And as, as her TED wish, uh, she has spent over a year now to create this uh, Charter of, for Compassion. And she has been working very hard with people all around the world, uh, with people from different religions, from uh, Islam, Buddhism, Hindu, and so on, to create this uh, Charter for Compassion. So here is uh, Karen Armstrong. Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, and also welcome to the people who are joining us right now online from all over the world. Uh, welcome. Um, this was, as you've just heard, a, a prize. It was Ted, when they give you this prize, they give you a wish. Now, this isn't the time to ask for a villa in the Bahamas. Uh, it's clearly a wish for a better world, and I knew immediately what it was I wanted to do. Because as my studies have continually shown me, and, as the, um, as, and in my own life has shown me, the essence of religion, of all religion, is compassion. The essence of all morality is compassion. The, uh, all the world faiths have developed their own version of what's been known as the golden rule. Don't do to others which, what you would not like them to do to you, or in the positive form, always treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. And um, I felt that this needed to be brought back to the centrality of our moral and religious lives. So often secondary goals and secondary enthusiasms get in the way and even uh, religion is, is used as a sort of to express hatred, uh, extremism, intolerance, unkindness. And so my idea was to create a charter for compassion that would be uh, to which people on, from all over the world uh, would be invited to contribute online. And it would be crafted finally by a panel of uh, leading and inspirational thinkers from the major faiths. And you've seen some of them up there on your screen. And now the charter's ready for the launch. We now have 65 partners worldwide uh, who are already working for Compassion, but now we are going to be able to work together uh, in order to change our world. Our world needs changing. Uh, we are drawn together more closely than ever before, electronically, financially, politically, and yet we are so terribly polarized. Um, and, and it seems to me that unless we are able to implement the golden rule globally, so that we treat all nations, all peoples, as we would wish to be treated ourselves, and treat their aspirations as, see them as important as our own. I doubt that we'll have a viable world to hand on to the next generation. So I'm begging all of you, please go to our brand new website that's being launched today, and sign up. Uh, Become partners yourselves, bring your own um, uh, enthusiasm, your own organization into, uh, into this, what I hope is a grassroots movement for a more compassionate world. Now, we've heard this morning, and it's absolutely right, that compassion is part of our humanity. Compassion is what makes a mother get up night and after night for, to her dying child. It's what makes us stay with our dying relatives instead of walking away as some of the animals do. We feel naturally with the other. One of the Chinese sages said that if uh, you saw uh, a child about to fall into a well, uh, there'd be something terribly wrong with a human being who just walked by. Uh, it's an instinctive lunge towards that child to save it. You feel its pain as if it were your own. But like all our human characteristics, compassion needs to be cultivated. 
we have to work on it, just as a dancer uses her natural powers of movement to create almost unearthly beauty, which is beyond the capacity for those of us whose bodies have not been trained in this way. But it demands hours and years of dedicated practice. So too, we need to cultivate compassion. Um, and if we do this, as Confucius said, all day and every day, uh, looking into our own hearts, discovering what it is that gives us pain, and then refusing under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else all day and every day, then we begin to cultivate and, uh, new uh, capacities of mind and heart. The religious would say it brings us into uh, the presence of God, or it brings us enlightenment. It takes us beyond the prism of selfishness and self-interest that holds us back from our best selves. Not many of us, as uh, His Holiness so wisely said this morning, are capable of achieving emptiness in the higher mystical meditative states. I know I, I, I'm certainly not. But if we practice compassion all day and every day, dethroning ourselves from the center of our world and putting another there. We learn about the egotism, and we learn to take that ego gently to one side. Um, Gandhi once said, you must yourselves become the change that you wish to see in the world. And that is crucial. Uh, it's no good just laying down the law about other people being compassionate. We need to start with our own hearts and minds. But above all, compassion is, uh, the, the charter will be a call for action. Um, it can't be just a question of us all embracing one another on November the 12th. Uh, this uh, is, uh, uh, it, it must be translated into practical action for a better world. The enlightened man must come down from the mountaintop. The enlightened woman, too, must return to the marketplace and there practice compassion for all living beings. And each in his or her own sphere can bring compassion into the world. If you're um, a, a, an educator, if you're a lawyer, if you're a banker, uh, if you're a politician, or if you're an army general, uh, if you start creating compassion in your own life, then uh, you uh, will, it must, you can't stop it. I think that's what I've found uh, in my own life. It, 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 it takes in everything. Um, compassion, at least in the Western world, is often misunderstood. People often think it simply means feeling sorry for somebody, feeling pity, uh, or that it's just an emotional softness. Compassion is hard. It means a disciplined effort all day and every day to put ourselves in the position of another. Uh, it demands an intellectual effort. If we wish to understand people who live, are far from us, we can't just rely on uh, the chance remark that we hear on television, an op-ed piece that we read somewhere, or um, an, another newspaper article we read somewhere else. We need to find out what lies behind some of the pain and disorder that we're seeing in our world, making an intellectual effort, making a dedicated emotional effort, uh, and making a moral effort. It's a religious and moral duty to work for the betterment of the whole of humanity. Um, it demands risk. It, it demands courage day by day and hour by hour to make ourselves vulnerable to the other. But let us use the suffering that we see uh, all around us in our own societies, our own families, um, and that pours into our homes every night on our television screens. We are presented, perhaps, as no uh, generation before our own, uh, with terrible images of suffering. 
Let us use this. Let, it, let us let it break our hearts and, and inspire our minds to find a solution, to find a solution for the betterment and the happiness of humanity. Um, I hope you'll work with me on this. Now, very often people say, yes, but this is a dangerous time. How can we trust the other? How can we love our enemies, as we heard this morning? It demands huge courage. But it, now, when things are difficult, is the time to practice. It's no good having these wonderful ideals only in an easy time. Enlightenment comes to us when we struggle with difficulty um, and our efforts become more intensive. We have a choice. Uh, we're not helpless. We have a choice. We can either select those uh, aspects of our moral traditions and uh, spiritual traditions that speak of hatred, or we can choose those that speak of compassion and dedicated love and commitment to the welfare of all beings on this planet. I do hope you'll join us in this endeavor. Thank you. Irish president. Karen. Karen, we were all deeply impressed with your passion and your persistence. You don't get anything done without persistence. But I have a third P to ask you about, practical. Yes. This is going to be launched on the 12th of November, this Charter on Compassion. What practical implications do you see? What are you hoping? Well, um, as I say, it must be translated into practical action. Now, it's not for me to give directions. All the partners are um, arranging their own events. First of all, first half is what's happening on November the 12th. You see, I think we need a two-pronged assault. Because there's such ignorance about what compassion is, we need an education. And so there needs to be more study, more thought about all this. But also, uh, that leads immediately into action. Now, in Australia, for example, uh, one of our partners is organizing an essay competition for students and children. In Kuala Lumpur, uh, they're putting up a wall of compassion where people can put up their artworks about compassion and can write things and, and, and contribute in that way. Bringing it into the forefront, getting people to think creatively about that. You have to be creative to be compassionate. And I'd like it to, be, it to become cool to be compassionate. Um, I'd like, um, I'd like uh, yes, and, and now in, in Europe, and this I think is an immensely significant development, uh, one of our partners is organizing the Muslim communities all over Europe in the holding of debates and events centered on compassion. Um, and there's going to be an art exhibition in New York. There's all these things are going on, but they can't stop there. Um, I'm now going to be working also with the FETSA uh, organization and who will help me carry this on. I'll probably be continuing to work on this until my dying day uh, because it's not, compassion is not going to be achieved overnight. Uh, I'm thinking of... Uh, this may be a wild idea, for example, but I'm thinking of encouraging um, sort of clubs or groups in schools and colleges where we could perhaps devise, with the help of the great spiritual leaders, uh, a t 12 points uh, step about how to educate ourselves and become more compassionate, as in Alcoholics Anon Anonymous. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Your Holiness, 
ladies and gentlemen, to moderate this afternoon. Those of you who've looked carefully at your programme will see that apparently to be a moderator today, you had to have the surname Robinson. <laughs> and actually, the surname Robinson came up recently in the White House. Uh, forgive me for dropping places and names, but um, I had the honour with, indeed, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and a number of others to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And when I met with uh, President... <laughs> no, that, isn't the, that isn't the point of the story. But when I met with uh, President Obama, I did point out to him that he and I have one particular thing in common. Each of us had the good sense to marry somebody with a surname Robinson. And <laughs> quick as a flash, he responded, and if only I'd taken her name, I could have done much better, much more quickly in politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, this truly is a very special occasion, and we have a very special panel here. And before I introduce them and we talk about compassion and we hear from them, I'd just like to give you uh, to share with you, indeed, an insight that I got myself in January of this year. It was a very significant lesson for me, and nothing will be quite the same for me after that, and I really appreciate what I learned. I was in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia, taking part in the second Sudanese Women's Forum on Darfur, which was being organized by a wonderful group, Fam Africa Solidarity, and we were helping them, bringing some women leaders. And on the first evening, I was encouraged to meet the steering committee of Sudanese women from Khartoum, from Juba in the south, and from the three regions of Darfur, and the diaspora. So there were seven Sudanese women. And I asked a friend of mine, Niradzai, to come with me. And I'm very glad I did, because when we sat down in the round chairs, I was about to do what probably I had done too often in the past, and that is plunge straight into. Now, what's our forum going to do? Are you going to adopt a constitution as you hope? What kind of, what's the agenda like? And Yuradzai said very quietly, she said, I think we should begin by just getting to know a little about each other. And I said to her, well, would you like to begin, Yuradzai? And she told us about growing up in Zimbabwe and why ultimately she became a human rights lawyer and she's now Secretary General of the YWCA. And then we listened to each of the steering committee as they described their background. One was the daughter of a prime, former prime minister of the Sudan. Another was the first in her village to go to secondary school and on to university, uh, third level. And one was a minister in the south but each of them spoke very personally. And the most interesting thing was the importance my father believed in me. My father helped me to get the same education. My father backed me and supported me. That was a common thread. But at the end of our discussion, we then went on to discuss the agenda, etc. I felt that there was a bond between us that would not have been there if we hadn't had that personal conversation. And I asked myself, and I hope we can discuss this a little in the panel, I asked myself, when peace talks happen, and we know that peace talks tend to be peace talks by the bad perpetrators. They get the television and the lights. Do they begin by telling personal stories? And if they did, would it actually make a difference? If in these tense, aggressive, non-peace talks very often, we can't get going and there's no give. Would a personal story help? Would that give that kind of insight which Karen was describing, that listening that puts you in the shoes of the other? I think it's really very well worth thinking about and certainly uh, for me it was a real sense of uh, never again will I launch straight into a discussion um, about the agenda or whatever in that context. I'll always begin by trying to meet the people more on the level that they're at and, and, and listen uh, very carefully. We have a wonderful panel here. I will begin, of course, naturally with His Holiness, but I don't have to spend too much time introducing him because he introduced himself extremely well this morning as a feminist. So you're <laughs> most welcome in this company. <laughs> And then we have three wonderful women Nobel laureates. And I know each of them, and it's a pleasure to be on the stage with them. I'll begin with Jodie uh, Williams, who I think is very well known to you. You know she was at the heart, the founding coordinator of the international campaign uh, to ban landmines, one of the most successful campaigns which succeeded in getting the treaty and has saved many, many, many lives. Uh, 
Um, she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997 and has gone on uh, to work assiduously since then, and as we'll hear, together with her sister, Nobel laureates. And now, naturally, it gives me quite a lot of pleasure with my Irish accent to introduce the next two, my very good friends from Ireland, Betty Williams, who, along with Mairead Maguire, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1976 for the work they both did as co-founders of the community of peace people in Northern Ireland. Betty has gone on. <laughs> Betty has gone on from there to head the Global Children's Foundation. She's president of the World Centers of Compassion for Children International. She has a center in Washington, DC. She also, I'm happy to say, has a center in Galway, in the west of Ireland, where I, where I come from, <laughs> close by. And Mairead, who was the co-founder and also uh, received the Nobel Prize, I remember the excitement in Ireland in 1976 from these two women who came from communities that were struggling to bring about peace. They were not people who were well known before the work that they did from the bottom up, and then they were honoured, and the whole of Ireland um, cheered uh, with them. And Mairead has also um, continued in her work for interreligious dialogue and peace, and indeed was recently um, in a boat arrested on international waters, uh, trying to get to Gaza, and held in detention for, for a week. And we already met this morning uh, the Reverend Impur Tutu. You were in the White House as well, so we, um, uh, we had fun together at that time as well. But it's wonderful that you can uh, rejoin uh, the panel. Um, I'm going to continue with the practical sense um, I'm going to sit beside His Holiness, and I'm going to uh, begin, Your Holiness, by, in fact, asking you, um, listening must be very important for true compassion. Could you tell us a little about how to listen and how to uh, understand a situation or people better because you've listened properly? Yeah. Must be my Irish accent. <laughs> Oh, yes, of course, you see. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Uh, I think compassion. Uh, compassion is not just a word, hmm. but some experience or feeling. So, in order to uh, get that feeling. The, some way the other's experience should feel yourself. Mm. So therefore, the explanation, just one word, not sufficient, mm. and more sort of detailed explanation, then uh, you get the feeling stronger, stronger, stronger. Then real sort of, mm. let's say there, a sense of sort of concern will develop. Hmm. Then there's the sort of Buddhist tradition. It says when you listen, uh, this is the case when you listen, you see the uh, teacher sort of lecture, uh, your eye, your mind, and correctly, all your energy must concentrate on there. What is being said? No. So, student, a, uh, supposed to listen and the, the teaching, mm -hmm. but meantime, I goes here and there, and there, <laughs> there. Then uh, uh, that may not go deep in your mind. So, all physical sort of attention mm -hmm. and the mental attention. That's important. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. I, I heard a wonderful description of listening in the context of, again, it was the Irish peace process, when Senator George Mitchell had come and had worked very hard on the ground in Belfast, as um, Betty and Mairead would, would, would recall. And um, he, was, he was actually getting somewhere. It wasn't the end of the peace process by any means, but clearly he was making progress. And I remember asking a former 
loyalist paramilitary, actually, but he had turned into a community worker with young people and was reaching across to Catholics. In, I think. And I said to him, Billy, I said, how do you explain the way in which Senator Mitchell seems to be becoming quite successful? And this was actually in my residence in Dublin, um, uh, Arasan Uthron. And I remember he looked at me and he used an expression I've never heard before or since. He said, Ach, President, he said, he listened us out. <laughs> and that was a very interesting, he listened us out, um, meaning real listening. So Betty, um, uh, you know, and this time it's Betty Williams. I've got the two Bettys, uh, or two Williams there, but Betty. Um, I think women, by their nature, tend to be very practical, and you've certainly been very practical in your approach. So how do you see compassion, and how would you relate it to your experience? I would like, first of all, to remember our friend in Burma, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi, who's under house arrest one more time. I would ask everyone in this audience to please try and help Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma. We carry her, all of us carry Sue in our hearts, and our big dream is that someday we will walk onto a stage and Dao on San Suu Kyi will be with us. It's an empty chair and a bunch yeah. of flowers yeah. because that's one incredibly brave woman. Mm. Um, I never used to be a very good listener. In fact, I wonder sometimes if I don't really listen, I should listen more. Because, you know, the Irish have the gift of the gab and you're inclined to be answering before the whole question's finished, you know? <laughs> so, but I'm, you know, it's, a, it's a, a character flaw and I'm really, really working on it very hard. Being able to listen a little bit better and not talk so much. And the practical way in which you've experienced um, the value of compassion? Well, I'm very blessed because, you know, how often does a human being get to sit in the company of His Holiness the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. and hear that kind of wisdom? He is our teacher and our spiritual guide, and then we have our little spiritual bubble <laughs> in South Africa. Uh, Bishop Tutu, we all call him the Arch, and we all adore him. And I remember him once when I was some, some event I was doing with him, you know, and I was kind of angry that day. Something had happened the day before which was very disturbing. And I was ranting and raving, and the arch looked at me and he said, you know it's okay to be angry at God? He understands, <laughs> you know? And so you get these little pearls of wisdom only if you listen. Because if I didn't now know that flaw that I'm working on and listening more. Mm -hmm. And over the last few years, I've learned a lot more by just shutting up. <laughs> Fair dues. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, Betty, you said you were blessed to be with His Holiness, and of course we all feel that. But I think in Christian terms we have a phrase, blessed art thou amongst women. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Jody, you, I know, are an activist, practical person, so give us some practical sense of compassion. Oh, I was, um, when, when I was understanding I was supposed to be speaking about compassion, I got nervous, and I'm not a nervous speaker. I was once called Attila the Hun, well, leading a... I was. Now you'll be calling me that. <laughs> she needles me. I was once called Attila the Hun while leading a delegation to El Salvador, Nicaragua uh, during the 1980s, during the wars, uh, uh, fueled, of course, by U.S. intervention. And so having Attila the Hun think about compassion really made me nervous. I'm good at talking about peace and things like that, but compassion made me e extremely nervous, so I started asking people about compassion, what they thought it meant. And one, 
echoed what the misconception that Karen had pointed out, that uh, pity, and it isn't pity. And I think of, honestly, when I think of compassion, I think wimpy, which is something, another word somebody said earlier this morning. And so I had to become, I had to keep thinking, and I was recently in Costa Rica right before here speaking with kids from high school in an organization called Peace Jam. As a matter of fact, we're all part of Peace Jam, the, the laureates. And I asked these young people about what's compassion, what's love, what's peace. And uh, one, one young woman captured, began to capture it in a way that I could work with. And she said, you must have compassion to have love and you must have love to have peace. And that sort of worked for me, but it went in a you know, fuzzy, warm, compassionate, <laughs> huggy kind of way. <laughs> and I found myself feeling nauseated. <laughs> And then I thought again that for me, and compassion is action. It's there, and uh, Bob, you're somewhere in the audience. I'm stealing this from Bob. I asked another guy yesterday about compassion, and he said he, he kind of got it as there but for the grace of God go I. And that's really the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. A friend of mine who has worked on Israel and the occupation of the Gaza for quite some time has been recently under attack. And he said a few things that made a lot of people angry and made him more open to attack for his work. And my husband and I were talking about it and, and I kept saying to Goose, the husband, that is his name, <laughs> I kept saying, oh God, Goose, there but for the grace of God go I, because my mouth is well, we fight over who doesn't know when to shut up. <laughs> and so many times there, but for the grace of God, would go I. That, to me, is the beginning of compassion. And if I can really put myself in the there, but for the grace of God, go I, maybe I can love. I mean, I love my mom. I love Goose and my sisters, but I get really stuck on the love. Six, seven, you, your holiness, you were talking, or somebody, that we're gonna be seven billion people. I assure you, I will never love seven billion people. <laughs> However, I recognize that I can appreciate their place on the planet, that I can feel compassion for the different lives that we have, that peace must come from love and compassion, and that peace is justice with equality, peace is the end of impunity, peace is not the dove and the rainbow and kumbaya, my lord, I'm sorry. That is not <laughs> peace in my book. It means getting up off your butt and taking their butt for the grace of God go I and going and helping change that situation. You know, sensitivity is a waste of emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you get up off your, I swear a lot I promised mom I wouldn't, in public after the Nobel Prize, I'm still struggling with that one. <laughs> get up off your butt and work about what you're sensitive about. I, sensitivity without action, you're the one who told me this. Just go get a beer and watch soccer or something. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think so. No, no. You mentioned action. You mentioned, um, uh, well, that it, it has to be um, linked in a practical way. Um, Karen, when she was describing it um, at the end, she said it required disciplined effort uh, to put ourselves in the position of another. And one of the things that struck me, and I want you to describe maybe briefly for us, Mairead, and I haven't, you, you don't know what's coming, um, uh, once women got the Nobel Peace Prize, all of a sudden, th these women, you, got together and formed the Nobel Women's Initiative. The men didn't do it over a very long period of time. The women did. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, I think that, um, uh, uh, that uh, Jodie had the idea that the women could work together, and she, 
she, it was actually Jodie who started that idea. Mm -hmm. And it's worked very well because um, we really can uh, contact each other immediately by phone and, and support each other in the different works. Uh, and um, I find too that there's a lot of issues that as women that we want to be looking at. Uh, Can and you give an example of some of the issues the Nobel Women's in Initiative is working on? Well, we've just come back from Guatemala, where we went, we were hosted there by Rigoberta Menchu, mm -hmm. and we were looking at the whole question there of violence mm -hmm. in Guatemala, and the, uh, the, the violence on women and their communities. Uh, so that would be one issue. And um, what but role would compassion play when you went together to, to be there? You know, how would you describe? Well, I think that the fact we just show that ordinary people, as we are all ordinary people, ordinary people um, coming together and just wor working on, on mm. issues together can make a difference. So mm. I, I think that, that, and then we go just to be in solidarity with people. We don't go to answer their problems, but just to share our own experiences mm. where we, we came out and say, look, it worked for us. And uh, this is a model that, that we used and to encourage them where they're working at mm. on the ground. So. Mm. Good, thank you. Um, Your Holiness, this morning, uh, towards the end, you said very wise words. You said very wise words during the early part too, but particularly um, your wise words at the end were to really almost see this century as a century where women have to play a full part. And you mentioned yourself as a, as a feminist in that context. And Impur, Impur I'd like to um, really ask you about your continent. The more I go to African countries, the more impressed I am with the way women are on the move. And it seems to me it's a move that really is linked to trying to address health, education, a better life for people in Africa. Can you say a little about that and link it with the notion of compassion? Mm. Can I answer another question before I answer the question Absolutely. that you just asked? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to um, put a working definition of love on the table, which is not quite so mushy-gushy, um, which is to say love isn't what we feel, it's what we do. It's how we treat each other. It's how we act. What we feel really doesn't matter much. What we do, how we treat each other, really matters infinitely. Okay. Um, and then to come back to the, the, the question, um, I think that for a long time, African women have allowed ourselves to be confined by culture. Um, and that we are coming to recognize that the confinement that is described for us by culture doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for our families. It doesn't work for our men folk. Um, let alone for our children, and that if we continue in the same vein, um, we will continue to have upheaval and famine and environmental degradation and war, um, etc., etc., etc. And so, since the men haven't yet seem to find another way of having a conversation with each other, um, <laughs> it's time. Mm. Um, and we're, we're not powerless. Mm. Um, we're, um, we actually do have authority in our own lives. Mm. And we are claiming that authority. Um, and quite frankly, we're fed up. <laughs> so, <laughs> enough's enough already.
and indeed it's reflected now in the institutions in Africa, uh, the Pan-African institutions, half of the members of the Commission of the African Union in uh, countries like Rwanda, the largest number of women in parliament in the world, and so many women at community level changing their circumstances. So um, I think it is very encouraging. Your Holiness, uh, I often reflect from my own world of values that matters a lot to me, that we haven't really conveyed the message well, and that is the message of human rights. Very often when people hear it, they see it as very political, aggressive, finger-pointing. And yet, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Dignity coming before rights. Can you help me to find the kind of wording that will convey a more rounded sense of that dignity and rights that is part of human rights? Sorry for the easy question. Of course, basically, uh, we, everybody, this is a belongs human being. So we are the same human being. I don't know. Of course, physical level, differences, man and female. But mentally, emotionally, same. I think it's des in the level of desire to achieve happy life, desire to overcome suffering, same. So then, right. I think the basis of the right is, I think, on the, uh, that's the desire. Ka, uh, desire for a happy life. Mm -hmm. So I think the human right uh, I don't know, those uh, trees or mountains can you say they also have some certain right? Well, I think we now understand that we have a, we have a stewardship responsibility. World, so. yes, <laughs> world. Or I think every every sort of living living thing have right to exist. That's I believe. From that way, something different. As far as human right is concerned, I think ultimate basis of that right is our desire to enjoy what? Our natural disposition to seek happiness. Huh? Mm -hmm. So on that, that level, same. Mm -hmm. Men, women, everybody. Oh. Right. So that's how I see where the basis for rights, mm -hmm. human rights is. Thank you. I think I'd like to, if I may, Your Holiness, just press you a little more on the dignity part. I do that because, as I think you are very well aware, the Universal Declaration drew from the great religions of the world. The drafters of it, Eleanor Roosevelt and her uh, colleagues who came from China, who came from Lebanon, from Canada, from Chile, from France, etc. They wanted a Universal Declaration that would draw on the spirituality of the different religions. And they then put this word dignity and rights in a Declaration on Human Rights. So how would, you, um, how would you capture that word dignity in more detail? Because it seems to me that it is very related to the notion of compassion. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're not allowed not to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think my right to say I don't know, that also... <laughs> uh, my, <laughs> part of my dignity. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm beginning to find this a very interesting panel. I mean, <laughs> Betty here says, you know, I talk too much, I must shut up. Um, Jody says... <laughs> I, you know, I came here feeling like Attila the Hun. <laughs> the Dalai Lama says, I don't know when you should know. <laughs> so, anyway, but... 
<laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw the question to you, Betty. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you know, you lived a very difficult time, you and Mairead, in Northern Ireland, where the violence was an affront to both dignity and rights. Um, where did you find that, that, pers you know, that personal inner strength to come through and lead a community for peace, basically? What a peace process. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm going to look for help from the audience. <laughs> but I have to tell you this. That I, had a, I had a wonderful father. Hmm. My daddy was the most precious gift that God ever gave me. And I really didn't realize how deeply I loved my father until he died. Because um, I remember once when I was, I was um, a very hard child to bring up, to say the least of it. My poor mother was demented, you know, because I had this self-will, you know. And, and I would even then not listen, Your Holiness. But anyway, and I remember one day I'd been particularly bad and my mother was saying to me, wait till your father comes home. Just you wait till your father comes home. And then she started writing things down that I was doing wrong, <laughs> you know. And by the time my daddy got home, I was terrified. And I remember running up the hall. Daddy came up the path, and I remember running up the hall, hiding behind the coats in the hall, but he could see my legs, you know. <laughs> and I remember my father going into the kitchen and saying, my mother said, now, George, you're going to have to do something about our Betty. She's been, and she went on and on and on and on, you know. And I'm standing in the hall, my heart's going boom, in my chest. And, and I heard my father saying, well, what did she do that's that bad, Margaret? And he said, oh, I, she, I just can't take any more Betty. She's just a, she said, I think she, you need to smack her. <laughs> and my father looked at my mother and said, Margaret, have I ever smacked you? And she said, certainly not. He said, why would I smack something smaller than you? And then he came up the hall. You see, this is, this is the effect good men have in our lives. If you're good fathers, you've no idea how much a daughter needs a good father, you know? Really, you don't. And then I remember my daddy coming up the hall, you know, and, and he took my hand from behind and he pushed me. He said, come on, love. He said, your mother, and I, your mother said, you and I need to talk. I'm looking up at him, you know. And he said, now, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> so he removed my fear. Hmm. And then he was able to address the issue of this hmm. self-will. Hmm. I had a wonderful father. Hmm. It sounds to me as if your father had a profound understanding of the kind of compassion that Karen has been talking exactly. about. Which, and um, uh, Judy... Uh, I remember you being very active on that campaign against landmines and, you know, uh, it was a real breakthrough because civil society with a few governments, Canada and other governments being prepared to give a lead, broke through the bureaucracy of the UN that every country had to see. Um, what was driving you at that stage and without being mushy, can you link it with <laughs> the issue of compassion which is kind of our theme? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, come on, Jody, get mushy. No. <laughs> I'm not going to be rude to you, Betty. Um, actually, we were talking last night over dinner about how many situations where people in power sit alone in a room and decide the fate of millions or billions. And they do it with no compassion. And by that, I mean no sense whatsoever of the impact of their words, their negotiations, their decisions on the lives of millions. And in the landmine campaign, we were and are. I mean, mm -hmm. the campaign persists, and I think that's the reason that the mine ban treaty continues to be an outstanding success of international law. We did not allow the men in suits sitting in the lovely halls of the UN in mm. Geneva looking at Mont Blanc over the lake 
We refuse to allow them to have the luxury of sitting in that gorgeous place, deciding the fate of people in countries around the world whose children and who themselves had to step out every day and worry about losing their lives or their limbs to a landmine. We brought reality to their face and we, just like you were saying, you know, sometimes people think human rights is aggressive. Well, if people behaved properly and with compassion, there would be no need for making them think about it. Landmine survivors themselves wanted to be part. It's like they weren't our poster children, believe me. They came to be part of this campaign because they wanted no other human beings to have to suffer what they suffered. And they came with thousands and thousands and thousands of signatures they had gathered from Cambodia. You know, thumbprint signatures from people who couldn't write from countries in Africa, and they wheeled in their wheelchairs to the chair of the, you know, the session negotiating nothing, and you know, put them to him and said, on behalf of everybody in the world who wants this treaty, we hand these to you, give them to the men in the room. And we did things like create a minefield in front of the entrance to the palais, so they had to walk through it. <laughs> And, randomly, they would get blown up or not. <laughs> we did things like, every 20 minutes, an explosion sound would go off inside the Palais. Because the estimate was, somewhere in the world, every 20 minutes, someone was affected by landmines. And so every 20 minutes, well, they're moving a comma in the, in, the tree, in the existing very bad treaty, they move the comma and think they did an excellent job of work that day. <laughs> Explosions would go off that they could not ignore. We made them confront the humanity of themselves that they didn't want to confront. And I believe we need to force compassion, and with all due respect, sir. <laughs> We need to force people to recognize their own humanity when they choose to hide behind their suit, or they choose to hide behind their position, or they choose to hide behind the comma of the negotiating session. And I think that's when you can really affect change, is when you make them, even if they won't do it in front of you, because then in, in their minds you have won, which is also a very messed up male construct. You know, it's like, no, we're, no, no, I'm not trying to beat you. Well, I, you know, in my youth. <laughs> I'm not trying to win a treaty. We are trying to give a, the gift of humanity to this world and stop this insanity. We're trying to make you recognize you're human. You know, that, that's a practical application. And it was so powerful, it was just done again with cluster bombs. And if we can do it again with nuclear weapons, we will live in a world without nuclear weapons, but it will take putting it in their face. And frankly, we also need it in relation to global warming, climate change, in December. Can you arrange to be there, arranging flooding and all kinds of things that will make a difference? <laughs> okay. We'll all you, Okay. <laughs> Mairead, you did a courageous thing recently. You went on um, a boat that was trying to bring vital supplies into Gaza and you were arrested on the high seas and you were detained. Um, were you in fear and what kept you going? 21 of us went to try to go to Gaza bringing medicines um, and unfortunately we were kidnapped in international waters by Israelis and taken put in, in a prison for a week but um, and we've been deported now from Israel and unfortunately can't go back to Palestine or to Israel but I think that um, 
Uh, yes, of course, we were frightened. It was pretty scary at times, but I think we went because we really believe that every single human life is sacred, and particularly the lives of little children and civilians who have nothing to do often in these war situations. But I think the whole idea of compassion, we really have to try to look a little bit deeper at it because, you know, the word compassion is made up of two Latin words, the root of which are cum and pate, which means to suffer with. So compassion is actually being prepared to suffer with people. And you know, as the Dalai Lama and the Buddhists tell us, life is suffering, we all suffer. So it's to suffer with the whole of humanity, but particularly those like the poor, the refugees, the people of Gaza, cut off from the world, one and a half million people. It's absolutely incredible. Breaks every human rights law in the book because we have the, we have the human rights laws. They're all there. So why can't we uphold international law and human rights? Because we have given our power to every government in the world to kill on our behalf. Every single government is built on the idea that the threat of force or the use of force. So it doesn't really matter what the vast majority of people in the world want. We all want peace. But when our governments decide to go to war, there's really not a great deal of things we can do about that, hard and all as we work. But I think compassion, you see, when we go into our own hearts and we ask ourselves, you know, why is there so much violence uh, in the world? Well, I really believe it's because in our minds we have this crazy idea, and it's, it's, it's a disturbing idea, that we can actually kill each other and that we can take the best young men in, in the world today and train them to kill and to, to, to use uh, torture. So we have cultivated this in our minds. So we are very compassionate. We're very loving. We're all for human rights. We're all for international. But when the chips are down, we will kill. And we do that for nationalism, for tribalism. So unless we come to the absolute belief that my life is sacred, it's a gift. <laughs> Your life is sacred, it's a gift. I have no right to kill you, you have no right to kill me, so let's solve our problems without killing each other. So we will only make, okay, we need to get rid of nuclear weapons, we need to get rid of war, but they'll discover something else where we can kill each other. So unless we make the quantum leap to build non-killing, non-violent societies wherever we live, we will destroy each other. So I would like to see a covenant uh, of non-killing, and we do it one by one. This is not a naive, idealistic stream. This is when you deepen your love and your compassion, and you become a fully alive human being, that you live that way. And do you know what? The vast majority of the human race has always lived in love and compassion. <laughs> it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, Mairead. And uh, I think in a way, what your voice was reflecting was what you felt when you couldn't bring those supplies into Gaza and the, the sheer injustice and unfairness of that and uh, the need to get rid of that kind of violence and that kind of, yeah. Um, I actually want to switch a little bit, Mpur. I know you won't answer my question, you'll answer some other question first, but I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask it anyway. Um, um, <clears throat> I've been dying to actually ask you, um, Betty spoke about the importance of her father. When I was telling the story of those Sudanese women, that was the unifying thing. My father believed in me. My father believed I was entitled to education. Uh, you have a father that is quite well known. <laughs> what was it like growing up um, with, uh, with Arch? I, and, and if you have any things that I can use later. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay, I have to admit, I, I never had another father, so I don't have one to really compare with. Um, but I, I think one of the things that was really important for us growing up wasn't just my father's parenting, but was my parents' relationship. 
And so, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> she's beautiful and he's unique, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but what, what we got to watch as children growing up was um, what it looks like to live in a relationship in which you are committed to working together, number one, um, in which you are committed to one another, um, in which you live respect, mutual respect. Um, so for, for the girls in the family, um, it was an opportunity to see what kind of lives we would want for ourselves, what kind of relationships we wanted for ourselves, um, regardless of who it is that we choose to be our partners. Um, this is what a good partnership looks like. Um, I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people growing up don't get to see that. They, you know, they don't get to see what, what mutual respect looks like on a daily basis. Um, it, it doesn't mean that they were always mushy-gushy, <laughs> although they are sometimes quite, yeah, right. <laughs> we have to remind them that it's a family program and so. <laughs> um, but but um, the fact of really having to work out choices together when what I want and what you want are divergent, how do we, how do we negotiate when we're talking about things that really do matter to us? And you, you know, it's, it's really hard to imagine world peace when you haven't seen an example of where peace can work. You know, what, what does it look like? What does peace look like when we each want what we want, how do we figure out how to come to a, a mutual understanding? How do we come to some mutuality of decision making? So I, I know that peace is possible. I've seen my parents. And I love the way you describe the relationship as though there wasn't the outside world that had to take so much of both your parents' time and that was so conflicted for much of your life. You know, um, obviously the relationship was so strong that that was less, less a, a, an issue. Um, I want to come back to uh, the uh, sense of compassion in peacekeeping situations. Um, and I was reminded again, I suppose it's because three of us are Irish on this panel by some odd circumstance, um, I was reminded of um, a recent part of the peace process in Northern Ireland when the parties had gone to St Andrews in Scotland. And the idea was to try to get the two parties, Sinn Féin and the party of the Reverend Ian Paisley, the Democratic Unionist Party, to come together in a, an executive in Northern Ireland. Now, the two governments wanted this, the British and Irish government, um, people really wanted this to happen, but it was not happening, mainly uh, because the Reverend Ian Paisley and his party members were saying no. And the negotiations in St. Andrews were not going very well. And I wasn't there, so I've heard this secondhand, but I think I'm more or less accurately portraying. Um, it was realized on a particular evening that the following morning, when the negotiations would again resume, but with not much hope, that it was actually the golden wedding anniversary of Dr. Paisley and his, his wife. And so, on the Irish side, it was decided to prepare a gift, a Waterford glass bowl. It's always a Waterford glass bowl. <laughs> and so, the bowl was prepared, put into a nice box, and the morning started with the Irish Taoiseach saying, before we begin our discussions today, I would just like, on behalf of the people of Ireland, to warmly congratulate Dr. Paisley and his wife on their 50th wedding anniversary. And I would like, on behalf of the people of Ireland, to give this small gift. And he stood up, and I'm told that the Reverend Ian Paisley jumped up from his side of the table and came round, nearly round to where, and the two men met, and went into a little huddle. 
And whatever happened, things went better after that. And, you know, everybody was very happy. And then I probably shouldn't tell the rest of this publicly, but I will. Um, almost immediately, the Irish humour was, the Reverend Ian Paisley says yes once every 50 years. <laughs> but... but, <laughs> but <laughs> But, Your Holiness, more seriously, I, I did want to ask you um, your thoughts about you know, the, the difficult issues that have to be negotiated, the uh, standoffs in discussions. In your view, um, would it help if there could in some way be, from this Charter on Compassion, a kind of guidance, start with personal stories? exchange with each other some insights into who you are before you begin negotiations. I just wondered if you had thoughts about that. Get a pen to it. Huh? Yes. Uh, of course, the particular case, now for example, when the East-West was in each of the divisions, to blocks, uh, and something, you see, uh, much depend on individual leaders. Then, in such case, uh, many years ago, I expressed those leaders without any sort of uh, complicated agenda, simply one week holiday and bring their uh, families yes. and just make known each other mm -hmm. and let their children play together mm -hmm. and meal together mm -hmm. and make known. Then, uh, once you see, the both sides develop some kind of uh, the other one, close sort of friend, that kind of feeling develop, mm -hmm. then these difficult a matter can be uh, negotiated. Yes, in such case, you see the personal uh, uh, contact or connection is something useful. But uh, we are talking about six million human beings sort of future. Six million human beings. And it will go up to nine billion. Uh, Maybe, yes. Yeah, that's right. And then mm -hmm. I think too much. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I think the real one real challenge is the population. Mm -hmm. And I think we should think seriously. Mm -hmm. The other day in Prague, as I mentioned, I think Prague, isn't it? And I'm a Buddhist monk. I already make some kind of the contribution <laughs> regarding family plan. <laughs> hmm? So rest of the people, mm -hmm. uh, more people become nuns and monks, then that, that can be... <laughs> so that's, I think, very, very serious matter. Hmm. I don't know. No. Then, uh, I want to tell you, uh, to share, hmm. to share with you is, the, what is the meaning of compassion? Compassion, or sense of uh, respect, others' right. And firstly, it's the compassion of cherishing oneself. That same sort of feeling extend to other. No. Mm. So self-hated person, impossible to develop compassion. Uh, so now compassion, respect others' right. And then also there is element of sense of responsibility. Uh, to do something. Uh, I think this morning I already mentioned, you see, the uh, a compassion develop on the level of we are human beings, they are human beings, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Uh, compassionate sort of feeling or closeness feeling 
because they are part of me. Now, from the religious viewpoint or racial viewpoint or national viewpoint, that's attachment, not compassion. Mm -hmm. Real compassion is universal as based on the human level. So, as I, I mentioned this morning, so I think many man-made problems. Actually, uh, we too much emphasis the secondary level, religious belief, or racials, or even within the same community, rich and poor, and educated or uneducated, or the family background, some richer or some more powerful, more respect, and poorer section, Neglect, that kind of story, discrimination. These are the secondary level. So compassion relates with the fundamental level. The other, irrespective whether believer or non-believer, whether this because of this because of that, this because of that, whether I mean the same nationality or same races, it doesn't matter. So long we are human beings. So on that level, develop sets of concern of their well-being. So that, I think, we need uh, more effort, mainly through education. Uh, then also, I think, uh, maybe it's relevant to make clear, the compassionate attitude does not mean you accept whatever they, 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 mm -hmm. they done. Mm -hmm. So here, the important is action and actor must make a distinction. Mm -hmm. So the compassion or sense of concern it, towards the person or the being. Uh, so as far as action is concerned, sometimes we need oppose, countermeasure, even harsh word, or some some extent. Even you see, as you mentioned, you see the certain sort of because of the, the uh, force method also is okay in order to oppose their action, but without losing genuine compassion towards the person. Mm -hmm. Actually, very reason why you're opposing that because of action, that unjust action, is because you have genuine concern about the, the actor's own well-being. If someone, because of that, because of that, killing other people, well, uh, then we must oppose so their action in order to help that person, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you say, out of compassion, out of sense of compassion of the being, then as far as action is concerned, we have to, sometimes we have to oppose so their wrongdoing. So that I think we must make a distinction. Sometimes uh, people you see, get the impression of compassion the attitude is passive way. And whatever they done, just the accident. Mm -hmm. Not that way. Mm -hmm. That I think important. Mm -hmm. Then, or then, perhaps in psychological or psychological or sort of emotional level, mental level, there's differences. Uh, one level of compassion is mainly biological factor, that comes spontaneous, no, tr no need training, like mother's affection to children, spontaneous. Uh, that, in, in reality, uh, almost you say, attachment, not genuine compassion, attachment. So that attachment or well, that form of compassion is oriented action or attitude. So long the other's attitude is nice towards you, that kind of sort of sense of concern, sense of compassion can develop. If the other's attitude slight change, then that compassion no longer there, even hatred develop. So that, uh, uh, Attachment uh, and also biased and limited. Sometimes too much attachment may bring hatred or anger. Too much love. And then a slight sort of mistake 
immediately it burst anger. So that's attachment. Now we are talking here, we need more effort to promote compassion. That compassion is uh, not oriented action or attitude, but oriented being itself to the person. So that we need reasons or training. Because that make familiar a cultivation. Think, 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 think. Uh, through that way, you can develop genuine sense of concern or of well-being of the other. Now that can extend towards your enemy. So that compassion is infinite, unbiased, without attachment. So that kind of attachment, that kind of compassion is based on reasons. The previous one is no reason, but simply emotional sort of because of the, the biological factor like that. But but is the compassion, the previous one, due to biological factor, that take as a seed. Then through reasoning, through wisdom, through intelligence, can because of that, can develop secondary level. That's unbiased. Your Holiness, you have said it all. <laughs> you have said it all. I think you have said it beautifully. Um, I think I would invite all of us to thank this excellent panel um, for sharing their thoughts with us.